more in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to thee. Holy Father, keep them in thy name, which thou hast given to me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in thy name, which thou hast given me. I have guarded them, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not pray that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou didst send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be consecrated in truth. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through the word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. All of scripture is about this pursuit of holiness, of how to follow God And so we have the Ten Commandments that lay out, very practically speaking, what it looks like to follow God. But we know those didn't go so well. And and we have this whole passage through the kings and the prophets. And even before we get there, the judges that God raised up and how things would go really well and then people would start to forget and fall away and then a huge crisis would come and there'd be a cry out, no, my gosh, and a leader would raise up and, and everyone would return and things would go well. And then again and again and again, the cycle goes on to the point where we have the passage from Jeremiah of, okay, it's not enough to have the law on stone. It's not enough to have the law raised up in leadership. I am going to write the law on your hearts so that it is a part of who you are. Except even that didn't work so well. And so God came God, God's self came. Maybe if I live out in Jesus Christ exactly what a life of love and of all this that I'm trying to teach you is, that you can see tangibly in person on a daily basis, maybe then you'll be able to get it and know and understand it. Except we know the stories, right, of the disciples not getting it, even with Jesus right there and going through. And even when Peter gets it, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus goes on to teach about his death. He's like, oh, no, no, not that. Um, It's hard. It's hard to learn truth that is other than what we know and what we understand and what we are continually immersed in in our societies and our cultures, whether that be Roman Empire or in democracy here today. But Jesus and God keep trying. And this passage from John is Jesus' final prayer with his disciples before his crucifixion and resurrection. And it's a pretty powerful thing that Jesus is praying. Jesus is praying for us to be a part of the Trinity, So as Jesus and God are one, Jesus is praying that we know that level of oneness, of unity with each other and with God, that we be drawn into the life of God to live in a way the Trinity lives, in relationship and love and all of those good foundational values that God taught us from the Ten Commandments And from that Micah passage, what is it that God requires of us but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly? And that's what the Trinity models, and that's what Jesus is praying that we be drawn into, that we experience, and that we know. 
This is the essence when we talked about the essence of our core of following Christ. It is thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May all of us on earth be drawn into the relationship of the Trinity that heaven witnesses every day. May that power, may that love, may that presence that is so full and mutual and real in heaven be realized here on earth. May that will, may that kingdom come. But it's so hard to do. And even when we get it, it falls away so quickly. And that's our story as Methodists, too. And last week, we talked about John Wesley and setting up that new meeting in Newcastle and coming back and seeing everyone falling away from this path of pursuing God and God's holiness and setting in three general rules that we are to do no harm, to do all the good we can, and to stay in love with God because the only way we can do no harm and do good is through God's power in us. And we talked about how we kicked people out of that group um, because they were not following in that way. And so we come to the day um, where the core of Methodists um, gets discovered. And my favorite part about this history um, is how we stumbled on it. This was not some group of folks intentionally, you know, doing a big, huge visioning process and figuring this out and setting the structure and living into it. This was them in a very practical concern of how to pay off the building once again in Bristol because I don't know why, but all holiness starts from financial concerns because that's the only thing that grabs our attention. Um, that's another sermon topic and another soapbox from another day. Um, but that is what they're wrestling with and what they're trying to figure out. And Captain Foy has this idea. You can picture any ART meeting or leadership council, right, of like, what do we do? And Captain's like, I think we need to divide everyone into groups of 12 and have a leader for each. And that leader will go around to those 12 people's houses once a week and we will collect a penny from each of them once a week and we will keep adding that up and that's the way that we're going to pay off the building. Well, everybody liked that idea except for the concern that was raised, well, what about the people who can't pay the penny and they're not able to? And so Captain Foy says, I will take the group um, of the folks we're most worried about being able to pay a penny and if they can't, I will make up the difference for that week and that's the way we'll, we'll go into this all together. And so they did, and the building got paid off, but they also discovered something else. They discovered entering into other people's lives on a deeper level than can ever happen on a Sunday worship experience. We, we have our coffee hour, we have our moments, um, but you know, you can only go two or three layers into the seven layer bean dip. There's just not time or proper space for anything deeper or further. But in visiting people's homes and seeing what was going on in their lives, and, you know, this is before cell phones and all kinds of technology to alert someone that you're coming so they can scurry and be prepared and get everything cleaned up, um, whether that be interpersonally or the house itself. Um, so you would stumble upon things happening. And that's what they found out. And the problems that John Wesley reports the most are drunkenness and domestic violence happening. Um, that were being discovered in these times. And so the building was paid off, but the class meeting, this gathering of 12 people, the small groups that were starting here, lasted the entirety of our movement because it's what gave the organization, it's what gave the support of watching over one another and love that made this whole holiness pursuit possible. So that there were people that one could trust that when life broke and fell apart, there was immediately support there. So you didn't have to immediately turn to alcohol because you were so overwhelmed and scared that there was no way of dealing with anything. That was the easiest thing to do to ignore and keep on going. So that when there was violence and brokenness, there was safety and places to go to, and there was accountability for how that that does not follow from the love of Christ. 
This is why a small group is so important. John Wesley called it the sinews of our society, of our coming together, the muscles that connect us, the very heart of who we are. Ask anybody from Financial Peace University, in fact, here's an accountability moment right now, how many people did a budget from March who are part of the Financial Peace University where we were shown how important budgets were, where we practiced budgets together? How many did one for March? I didn't. How many? Oh, oh, all right. We have the Gold Star students in the house. Okay, but of how many people that were a part of that group? 30. 30? Oh, okay, so we have two units who have done a budget for March. That's the example right? We can study scripture. We can come to worship and hear my fabulous sermons explain everything. We can gather. We can know who we are. We can know what God wants of us, but it's an entirely different thing to live it out and to make room and to make space for it. And so to intentionally set aside an hour and a half once a week to come together, that's where the life happens, that's where the support happens. That's where the accountability happens. That's where everything comes together for how we follow God and how we live our lives. So that when we share our joys and concerns of best friends being diagnosed with cancer, of accidents that have happened, we immediately have a place where we can talk about how that is breaking our faith with God, of how angry we are, or how it's drawing us together because of how it is showing us what our true priorities need to be. We can celebrate that together. We can cry together. We have space to bring who we are to be grown. And there'll be great mountaintop experiences, whether that's at rock, whether that's on a chrysalis or Emmaus journey, whether that's at the men's retreat next weekend. There will be great phenomenal moments like there were in the field preaching where there were thousands of people gathered. But I want to share this quote from you um, from a person who had a conversation with George Whitfield, another of the preachers of the day um, with John Wesley. Um, from long experience, I know the propriety of Mr. Wesley's advice. Establish class meetings and form societies wherever you preach and have attentive hearers. For wherever we have preached without doing so, the word has been like seed by the wayside. It was by this means, the small groups, we have been enabled to establish permanent and holy churches over the world. Mr. Wesley saw the necessity of this from the beginning. Mr. Whitfield, when he separated from Mr. Wesley, did not follow it. And what was the consequence? The fruit of Mr. Whitfield's labor died with himself. Mr. Wesley's remains and multiplies. So will we be followers that come together in ways that not only in our personal lives bring the high moments of the truth that we learn into our daily living, but also then for our communities, for our churches. Will Epworth be a church that exists only for those of us who are gathered here right now in this particular time? Or will we plant seed and root it in such a way that it will outlast and outlive every single one of us in the mission and in the life that it brings. If we look through the book of Acts, when we have these great speeches of what Christ's salvation means, it's not from the disciples pulling out their boxes and standing and preaching it starts with people asking a question. It starts with people being so curious about something so different that they don't understand. Who are you? And what are you about? Why are you living like this? May we live in such a way that everyone around us can see something different 
and that it can spark such a curiosity that they want to know more. That is following Christ. That is following Christ in such a way that the law is written on our hearts in such a way that every piece of our living testifies to the life, to the love, to the salvation that we have. That is living in such a way that we are made one with God in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we come to this table. We come to this table because we can't do this journey alone. We can't, with a true heart, do 